Thank you for joining a new podcast series from ILTA Radio entitled Work From Home. This series takes a look at many different facets of the organizational, technical, and human sides of the remote work experience. Join us as we find new, interesting, and innovative ways to keep productivity and morale up. Good morning and welcome to ILTA's new Work From Home podcast series. We're excited today to be joined by Jim Morio, the principal at Cornerstone IT. My name is Beth Ann Stubbe and I'm the Director of Publications and Press at ILTA and I am joined by Don Hudgens, VP of Brand and Events, along with Marty Phillips, she's the VP of Education. Thank you all for joining us today as we talk really quickly through the COVID work from home procedures and really what else is happening in the marketplace and how we can help every ILTON work remotely. Jim, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Beth. We're excited mainly to talk about the idea that work from home is becoming not only much more socially acceptable, but certainly in the face of this virus, a much more tenable choice. Can you walk me through the you know, sort of plans that Cornerstone IT has put into place for its employees? Sure. Cornerstone, when we started 17 years ago, my brother and I had been working in the legal and technology industry for many years and for many hours and became a, a sort of a, a goal of ours to build a company that allowed people the flexibility to work from home, to work from anywhere. So it was really one of the original tenets of, of Cornerstone that we create a company that we knew people were going to work hard and there was going to be nights and weekends, but we wanted to give them an environment to be sort of a virtual company where they could work from Starbucks, they could work from home, they could come into one of our offices and work from there. So it was really one of the, one of the original ideas behind Cornerstone. And so 17 years later, we have, although we have four official offices, we have employees in probably somewhere around 18 different states across the United States. And we even have some folks that work internationally in the Philippines. So we are pretty much a virtual company, albeit we have some official offices. Most of our staff work remotely. Marty and Don, from ILTA's perspective, we've been able to kind of adjust our events and our education. How do you guys think that we're handling these resources for ILTAs? And then partnering with Cornerstone, we're talking about more remote options. Do you think that this is a trend that will continue? It's been building is a trend that will continue. And I think it's a trend that you'll see. I mean, you see it already in our community, but I think you're going to start seeing it more in a corporation or university. You're, you're seeing that now. So yeah, I think it, it is a trend that's going to build for us. And Dawn, what about our resources side? We've put a, a relatively robust website together. We have. So we've, well, at least for this particular situation, we are getting the communications out as, as quickly as possible and trying to look at everything not, not just for this one incident, but best practices moving forward, taking a look at it from a lot of different angles to make sure that, that we're kind of covered with best practices from this point going forward, as well as, you know, trying to make sure that, that our people are covered in this time, too, with the questions and the things that they have, because things are moving faster than I think we, we even thought that they would. I think that the moving faster period is, is one of those parts that we didn't see coming. And Jim, in a crunch, kind of where unmanaged personal computers have to be used for remote access. You know, we didn't, we didn't see this. We weren't able to plan for people to take things home with them. How can unmanaged personal computers be used for remote access? And what are your recommendations for assessing security beyond abstractions offered by, you know, remote 2FAs? Great question. Uh, there's sort of the traditional method, which has been around for many years. That's the Citrix client. You, uh, the small piece of software that gets installed on the unmanaged PC or, or Mac, for that be, matter, that allows the attorney, staff, other professionals to connect securely to the to their firm. And then there's sort of newer solutions like the iGel solution, which is essentially an operating system on a thumb drive that you can configure to connect across the internet to a specific URL address where you send it home to your attorney staff or the professionals, have them put into their PC, reboot the machine, it'll boot from that thumb drive and connect them securely. And, and you're, there's no, you're not using the operating system of the PC that's at home. You're using this thumb drive operating system that you know is secure and you sent home to the employee. I really love the idea of security because security, whether or not we have a virus outbreak or a pandemic or whatever we have, is always at the top of our forefront from either the cloud side or the on-prem side. 
Can you talk to me a little bit about one step further? What's the best mobile communication apps that are out there that can be really used as that backup, as you say, for law firm communications in the event that workers have a really low bandwidth? We don't all want to go to Starbucks. You know, it's, it's what everyone's using today. I mean, their mobile phones, whether they're on cellular or they get, they, they get Wi-Fi, it's their iPhones, it's their Androids and the applications that are installed on them. Today are our enterprise level applications, whether it's Outlook for iOS or, or some of the native applications. As long as that endpoint has got some type of management, mobile device management, mobile application management, where the firm can secure that data and those applications, that's really all you need. The, the, the phones today, have the capability and the and the applications to provide those that connectivity on, on low bandwidth connections and, and remote work. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the VPN side of all of this and your best practices and recommendations? Sure. You know, it, it kind of evolved the Citrix virtual desktop virtual apps. It's been around a long time, but but a couple of years ago when Surface Pro started to become more popular, there was a uptake in laptop and, and Surface Pro use. So with that, the attorney staff and other professionals took their, took their applications and their data with them. So then for them to connect to the, to the firm's network, you needed some type of VPN. The Cisco VPNs and the Palo Altos, they've been around for a while, and those are sort of tried and true. But more recently, Microsoft's Direct Access and Always On VPN, which comes built into the Windows operating system, makes it for an easier connection. You don't have to start up a separate VPN client. You go home, you get on your Wi-Fi, and the Windows operating system connects back to the firm, auto, I'll say automatically, and creates that secure connection. So that's been the trend of late. Microsoft's VPN client that's built into the enterprise edition of Windows. And that's been pretty reliable and, and scalable from, from our experience. What are your best recommendations for someone who has never worked from home? We did that quick poll that said a lot of lawyers had never, ever worked from home. How would you advise them? Yeah, I mean, certainly you need a quiet space, whether it's children, dogs, UPS man. You, know, you definitely need a, a dedicated space space to, to focus, concentrate, be productive. The other is, is your internet connection. Uh, it sounds obvious, but there's plenty of homes that don't have good quality internet service, or maybe it needs to get, uh, up, get upgraded, as well as the Wi-Fi service in, in your house. So it seems obvious, but that is, if you talk to any IT director or, or operations manager, when the attorney complains about remote access, Nine out of 10 times, it's really their Wi-Fi at home and not the remote access system that's the problem. Marty, recently you were at a major university. Can you talk to me a little bit about their remote and work from home practices? Well, the university that I was involved with, they had online an online program. And so they had lots of online students, but their remote best practices for the people on site, totally archaic. And right now, they are having to work through what are we going to do? And they're having to mesh their online and their on-site model. So I think that you're seeing all these universities going virtual, and they're ready because they have these online programs. But I think smaller universities like the one I came from are going to struggle a little bit with their archaic technology. Don, a question for you. From our events and the greater conference and events sphere, how do you think the remote work from home experience is going to change attendance? Are we going to go more live stream or do you think we're going to continue to stay in person as this virus situation evolves? I honestly do not believe that there's ever a conference online that'll take the place of that elbow to elbow networking that you get from being in person. However, having said that, you know, virtually lends itself to some great opportunities with education and with virtual conferencing. And so, I'll be honest, we are looking at some of those opportunities to see what that looks like. And I think going forward, we'll be looking at that a lot, but I don't think it'll ever fully replace the face-to-face -face portion of, of a conference. Jim, the face-to-face -face and the remote work experiences are wildly different, but there are other requirements we have to take into, you know, not only our understanding, but other organizations' understandings. Can we talk a little bit about the OSHA requirements for remote workers, even on a temporary basis? 
Unfortunately, Beth, I, I, I'm not an expert on, on OSHA. I know that the uh, employer needs to provide a workspace, a healthy and comfortable workspace. How that applies to home remote users, I, I, I couldn't answer it directly. But you do bring up a good point because we're going to be talking to the other principal at Cornerstone IT on work from home number two next week. Yes. My brother, Tom, has got his PhD in organizational psychology, and he is he also heads up our human resources department. He is intimately involved in, in the psychology and health of, of our employees and how they work from home and be productive and, and feel involved in the organization, even though uh, they may not be face-to-face with some of our employees for weeks, if not months. That's got to be hard. Dawn, from the culture of working remotely perspective, I know you've got a lot of information and a really good handle on this. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. You know, a lot of organizations have started going virtually just to create some additional office space. And with that comes some normalcy practices that work great virtually as well. And Bethann, as you know, on our team, you know, every Monday morning we have a team a meeting where we gather together and chat about our weekends, just as you would in the break room or around the water cooler from uh, at any office. And that helps create some bonds when we work with our tools, such as Slack or other tools that are available, making sure that you are utilizing the video aspect of it from time to time and that people are on the same playing field and learning some of the best practices working virtually when it comes to sound and audio, those types of things. And from a manager perspective, making sure that you check in on your people a little bit more frequently than you would if you were actually at an office where you would see one another face-to-face. That way you know if people are still engaged and making sure that that they're okay, especially with this being a new type of environment for a lot of people. But as uh, our team has seen, you know, it can also create some additional things because you end up, I think, sometimes working a little bit longer and staying more focused because you do have a little bit more of a solitude sometimes when you're working. That can be both a positive and a negative. So you have to manage from that aspect as well. There's several things that you can take a look at as you start working from a virtual perspective that can improve the opportunity. Jim, from a licensing perspective, is there anything you would suggest a remote worker definitely have? Two-factor authentication without question. And as firms extend their technology out, to the remote workers, they make themselves more vulnerable to hacks, malware, et cetera. So having that multi-factor, two-factor authentication is critical. The analogy that I give managing partners is if you don't have that two-factor authentication, it's like putting your PC out on the street or in Starbucks. Anybody could try and log into it. So critical that that you have multi-factor authentication. Marty, as we begin to close out this conversation for work from home number one, is there anything you would suggest about practicing or or dealing with working from home as as people have to evolve their situations? The one thing I'll say that was my advice to attorneys when we dealt with this in Houston, we had, as you recall, we had a hurricane and it affected New Orleans, but Houston got the the dirty side of it. And so we were out of work for about three weeks, things like no power, things like that. And so I would say practice now. If you're not used to working from home, go home and practice now because and practice with a coworker that's working from home. It's kind of uncomfortable when you first start it. And some of our attorneys didn't get the knack of it. So start now and practicing. And the other thing I would say is some of the situations that we came in contact with were Sometimes people actually had to go into the office. Like sometimes you have to physically go in and turn off a server or reboot something or something like that. So have a, have a best practice or a plan for that because it is going to happen. Jim, any last recommendations as we talk through the, the variable work from home process? Yeah, it, it sounds obvious, but testing, working from you know, having your help desk coordinate with with the end users, with the employees preparing before they go home to work from home. I think there, I've, I've spoke to some CIOs who are doing a dry run with one of their regional offices, telling their DC office, the 
the 25 or 30 folks in that office to go home and work from home on Friday and the lesson they'll learn from that experience. So user acceptance testing is, uh, is critical, uh, working from home, giving them a checklist, simple checklist, hey, connect, print, save a document, send an email, authenticate. It, it doesn't have to be a complex checklist, just a simple checklist to prove that they can work from home. Well, thank you guys for joining us today on our work from home number one. We're not excited to always work from home, but it's definitely part of our new jobs as we kind of take a look at 2020 and this evolving coronavirus. Jim, Don, and Marty, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Bethan. We'll see you next week with work from home number two.